Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here at Synopsys with Manmeet Walia, who's going to talk today about placing macros in a PHY for a high-speed service. So Manmeet, when engineers are working with uh, PHYs, what sort of problems do you find when they're trying to place those macros in the PHYs for the service? Yeah. Hey, hey, Ed. Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, we're talking again about hyperscale data centers here. Uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, large server chips, large switch chips, large networking chips, and what's happening is that these chips are getting larger and larger in size. Uh, they're approaching their radical size limits, and uh, and they have a lot of IOs around them. Uh, as an example. Uh, if you look at the Radix switch chips, uh, they're going up from 6.4 terabits to 12.8 and now 25.6 terabits. Uh, a 25.6 terabit Radix switch chip would have 256 lanes of 100 gig phys. And we are usually talking about power performance in area, uh, but what gets, what gets really, really important is being having a phi that is laid out in a manner that can be placed on all four edges of the die. So not only being optimized for north-south placement, as an example, it should be optimized to be placed on all edges of the die. Uh, we should be able to stack these phi's deeper into the SOC, and we should be able to have a path for the parallel side going into the into the SOC. Uh, so all your PCSs and controllers, they should be there should be an easy path going into the SOC, and there should be a path coming out on the package substrate. So all of these considerations need to be taken into account as we are building these PHY chips or PHY IPs. This is incredibly complicated. Let's drill down into this. Sure, Ed. So, Manny, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is uh, just a progression of uh, Radix with chips. And uh, what we have here, like we talked about, uh, we're moving from 12.8 terabit switches to 25.6 terabit switches. And these would have uh, 256 lanes of 100 gig phys around them, or 100 gig series lanes around them. In this case, these high-end IPs that we are building and enabling our customers with are square macros. They're flexible macros that can be placed on all four edges of the die, and and uh, they 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 uh, can be stacked deeper into the SOC. And they should have easy escape paths coming out on the package substrate and escape paths for the parallel signals to go inside the SOC. So all these considerations are very, very important. We keep talking about PPAs all the time, power, performance, and area. But along with area, what really matters a lot is a optimized macro. Again, that can go on all four edges of die, that can be stacked, and that provides an easy routability both on the package substrate and into the SOC. And part of the problem that you're running into here is that you're trying to move data across a very large chip and it's more data than you were moving in the past, right? So now you have to figure out what's the most efficient way to get it from one side of the chip to another or even just around the chip. Exactly. So with so many hundreds of lanes in a single SOC, you have to get all these signals inside the SOC onto your, your system bus. And then you have to get all these signals out on the package substrate. And there are many, many considerations here with regards to cost, crosstalk and whatnot. And, and then you have to transfer them either chip to chip or on a copper cable to the other side of the other side of the rack, et cetera, et cetera. So what do these macros look like? So let me let me just show you an example of uh, what Synopsys is trying to do here. This is an example of our 100 gig phys. We provide them in different flexible lane configurations. And what we do is we clearly separate out the analog and the digital. So our digital signal processing flows around our analog blocks. Uh, we, we lay these macros out in a two by two tile format. And, and by moving around these analog blocks without actually having to change the analog blocks, we can re-PNR the digital to make this macro optimized for all four edges of the die. We can optimize this macro to go to stack it deeper into the SOC. What I'm showing you right now on the left side as an example is a four lane macro. It's, it's optimized for north south. But very, but very easily, this macro can be re-PNR to make it optimized for the east-west direction, and it's very easy to stack this macro deeper into the SOC. So essentially, we would have we would have four lanes stacked deeper into the SOC because each each block is two in in a two by two tile format here. 
A lot of the chips that are being developed at these most advanced nodes uh, are not getting the benefits of scaling and therefore they're moving into uh, multiple, multiple dimensions. So you're not seeing just uh, a single planar chip. It's now chips in a package, sometimes through an interposer. How does that affect what's going on here? It's a couple of things. A lot of times these chips end up being IO limited versus being core limited. So being able to stack and squeeze all of these lanes inside a single SOC is very critical. As far as interposers are concerned, what Synopsys is doing is these IPs are built so that we can easily customize them for micro bump technologies. They usually come as standard C4 or copper pillar bumps, but the, the way these are designed is to be easily transferred into a, into a design which would be micro bump friendly. We have very careful considerations there in terms of signal integrity, in terms of number of micro bumps that will be replacing the C4 bump. And all these are done with very careful considerations working in conjunction with the interposer designer, in conjunction with the package design, etc. Would you expect to find this at 16 nanometers or is this pretty much limited to the most advanced nodes? Yeah, so right now it's mostly limited to seven and below. And we are very aggressively building our portfolio uh, for seven and five and even below that. So mostly it's in uh, seven nanometer and below FinFET nodes. And there you start running into a lot of real estate constraints too, right? Because now you have so much packed into a very, very small area. Those lanes are very tightly packed together. Yes, exactly. And that's a good question because as we are going from seven to five and below five, the analog circuits are really not gaining from the process technology scaling. In fact, it works in the other direction in terms that we have tighter layout constraints, we have higher parasitics, etc. So what we have to do with every process node scaling is we have to innovate with the architecture. As an example, as we're going from seven into five and then into three, we have to continuously innovate uh, and improve our architecture so that we can actually get area scaling. And that area scaling is not coming because of the process geometry, but it's coming because of the architectural innovations at this point. You're also starting to see, even with digital circuitry, it's behaving more analog-like. It's much more susceptible to noise at 5 and 3 nanometers, electromagnetic interference, uh, things that were second, third order effects at the upper nodes are now starting to become first order effects down at, at the lower nodes. Um, all that plays into this as well, too, right? You're trying to guarantee signal integrity across this die. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and that's very, very true here as well with respect to the DSP circuits, etc. So again, at Synopsys, what we are doing with these very high-end FIs is we are putting a lot of the protocol agnostic intelligence out in the firmware. So we are putting all this into a soft layer and then we, we put all this intelligence into a firmware that would then reside into an SRAM. And what this allows us to do is to, it makes it very flexible. We can continuously evolve and improve these algorithms that are managing all the calibration state machines, you know, all these complex algorithms that manage temperature cycling and whatnot. Uh, so moving this intelligence out of the hard macro really, really helps long term, and it helps us to continuously improve and innovate with these uh, with these IPs. And that helps with a couple other areas too, right? Because now you a lot of these chips are being used for some sort of uh, AI as well as going into new applications. So the algorithms are under a constant change. The markets that they're going into are generally pretty nascent. The technologies themselves are just still evolving. So re you really do need to be able to keep these things flexible and able to react to whatever's changing out in the market, new protocols, whatever changes are coming in. Yeah, precisely. I mean, if you look at the IEEE 100 gig specs, they're still not defined. And AI is very proprietary, right? The way AI architectures are scaling, the way the scaling happens between dies, chip to chip, uh, within a rack or rack to rack, etc. It's very, very proprietary. Uh, their channels are very proprietary in some cases. So being able to put all this protocol agnostic intelligence outside the IP and being able to modify it later on through firmware uh, that resides in a SRAM is a very powerful feature. And it, it gives us the flexibility, which would then allow us to modify some of these things depending on customers' unique use cases and their unique architectures. How does this look in other examples? What what else can you show us? Yeah, so let, let, let's you know this is an example of when when we put our IPs into the SOC, 
And what we are trying to say here is that we allow our high-end IPs to be placed on all four edges of the die. When we do that, we, we provide very clear, precise guidelines to our customers in terms of whether they have to flip these macros or not. How do they create spacing between these macros to bring the signals into the SOC? How do they optimize their high-speed transmit receive paths so that they can easily escape all these high-speed signals on the package substrate? And then every time we would put ourselves in our customers' shoes, as an example, we would run the entire backend flow on our own. We would place these macros aggregate them, place them on all edges of the die, north, south, east, west. We would go through the entire exercise of floor planning them, doing the entire hierarchy of the PCSs, the MAC layers, etc. We would do the full bumping or micro bumping in case of interposers. We would always put ourselves into what our customers would have to do. We would put ourselves in their shoes and go through that entire experience, in that entire flow of, of what our customers would be doing. In a lot of cases, we learn from our customers and we are very effectively able to cross-pollinate that information. So this is a good example of uh, how we run into integration challenges. All this layout that you see in uh, these different colors is happening at uh, 1.75 gigahertz speeds and being able to go through this entire flow with the PCSs, with the Mac layers, with the controllers, etc., is extremely important because we learn ourselves a lot as we go through this and we can give very good guidelines to our customers to enable easy integration. When you go back a couple of nodes, was the place and route so difficult as it is here? Are you starting to run into issues that you weren't in the past? And do you have the alerts to send out, this is legal, this is not? Yeah, so if you look at, as an example, let's just take example of PCI Gen 5, which is running at uh, 32 gigabits per second. We are bringing out a 32-bit parallel bus out on the parallel side. So that's about a 1 gigahertz timing closure required there. Similarly, for 112 gig series, we are bringing out a 160-bit parallel bus, which is just under a 1 gig timing closure required there. We also have other offerings in case of die to die, etc., where we do need timing closures close to 2 gig. So the controllers, the Mac layers, the PCSs are getting more complicated. The speeds are getting higher and higher. So being able to compress all this, lay it out, going into the SOC side, providing clean, easy paths, especially when you have 256 lanes or hundreds of lanes in these SOCs, it, it gets really complicated. And, and that's why we make it a point that we ourselves go through this experience before we, we provide these things to our customers so that we can educate them and it's easy to integrate these IPs for them. And it gets even worse as we move down into uh, five and three nanometers, right? Because now you have all these power rails and uh, cooling uh, systems. You have power delivery networks. You have leakage coming out of all sorts of things because the dielectrics are thinner. They're, ne they're now measured in uh, less than 40 atoms in a lot of cases, sometimes even in a handful of atoms in some, some areas. So now you have to have everything perfect. And if something's off, then it disrupts everything in the layout here. Yeah, again, like, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, these smaller geometries are necessarily not helping us a lot uh, <laughs> in case of scaling these analog IPs in terms of speeds and uh, in terms of performance. And, and it, it, it is getting harder and harder as the process geometries are getting smaller. At what point does it not work anymore and you say, okay, this now has to move off the chip. It has to be somewhere else. And you start probably with the 30s. So we, we are kind of reaching those limits, you know, at five and possibly at three, we are beginning to reach some of these limits. And, and that's why Synopsys is beginning to offer a lot of the die-to-die -die portfolio. And one of the use cases in our die-to-die -die portfolio is that our customers are separating out or fragmenting their, if I can call it the core chip from the IO chip. And the idea there is they will continue to scale their core SOC, you know, whether that's an FPGA fabric or whether that's a C of microprocessors or whether that's a Radix switch. And they will separate out all the IOs on a, on a relatively larger geometry, right? And they're going to connect them through very simplistic, minimalistic die-to-die -die files that are, that are about five to six times smaller in area, smaller in power than your typical long-reach files. I notice in the bottom picture here on the bottom left, you're starting to stack these macros. 
how do you go about doing that or what sort of issues do you run into? Yeah, so uh, again, to get the IO density high, we, we have to stack the macros and these macros are designed to be stackable. And remember our 112 gig series, our PAM4 files are laid out in two by two formats. So they already have stacked two lanes within a macro, but then we allow these macros to be stacked on top of these. And what we are showing here is that we would provide our customers with, you know, guidelines on what the gap should be, which should be essential to get all your uh, PCS and the MAC signals out into the SOC. We do package substrate simulations, mock-ups to make sure all the high-speed signals can come out on the substrate easily. Uh, this is kind of shown here, all the escape studies on, on the substrate side, how they're coming out. Uh, you know, for our high-speed FIs, we look at different uh, low-cost options like 5 to 5 layers or 6 to 6, and then even go all the way up to 7 to 7. We do a lot of crosstalk studies as hundreds of these lanes are coming together. We, we take all this into a HFSS environments because again at these speeds with so many lanes together EMI uh, is going to be a big issue so we we run all the HFSS simulations to make sure that electromagnetic induction is not an issue and all these are very complex exercises the message I'm trying to provide here is that there's an effort to get to the GDS of the IP but literally we put more effort now after the GDS is done into all these backend studies, into all these integration studies, you know, supporting our customers and helping them to, to integrate these IPs into their SOC. And there's a lot of effort that goes into all this stuff. In the past, you used to be able to guard band a lot of this design and make sure that it would all work. And if it didn't, then you had at least some margin to play with. You don't have that anymore. So now everything has to be absolutely precise, right? Exactly. And, and you know, there used to be a saying at Synopsys, and that saying was that our IPs are very hard to design so that they are easy to integrate for our customers. And, you know, that doesn't hold very true anymore. These IPs are very hard to design, but they are still hard to integrate. And that's why we are working on all these backend exercises to make sure that we make it relatively easier for our customers to use these IPs. These are, again, very complex products. These are very complex IPs, and it takes a lot of considerations from every direction to make sure that they're being used and integrated properly. And this is where Synopsys really tries to differentiate to make sure that our customers are successful when they're using our IPs. So what are the IPs you actually need to make this work? Our design where high performance compute and networking portfolio includes, you know, the high end PCIe, which is 5.0 going to 6.0. It includes the high end Ethernet, which is 112 gig FIs. It includes die to die offerings, both serial, which is ultra short reach, extra short reach, 112 gig series. And also on the parallel die to die connectivity, which is HBI compliant or AIB compliant offerings. We also include the high-end DDR5.4 and also HBM2E. Together with embedded memories and libraries, they make our portfolio for the high-performance computer and networking market. Mamet Walea, thanks for another great explanation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much.